So we are continuing with part two of Elevating Women in Eye Care. Our next session is going to be presented by one of the most famous women optometrists in the industry, Dr. Dori Carlson. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dori Carlson. Dr. Carlson was the first woman to serve as president of the American Optometric Association. Recently, Optometric Management named her as one of the most influential in optometry, as well as Primary Care News identified her as a pioneer in optometry. She was the first female president of the North Dakota Optometric Association, and she was honored as the North Dakota Young Optometrist of the Year, as well as Optometrist of the Year. She, along with her husband, Dr. Mark Helgeson, founded Heartland Eye Care, a multi-location practice in North Dakota more than 20 years ago. And Dr. Carlson is, has always been incredibly inspiring to me. When I was a student, she was the keynote speaker at our graduation. And I love the stories that she, that she talked about. Uh, not that you're going to talk about how you were recruited to North Dakota, but I always think that story is really cute. But obviously, Dr. Carlson is a huge pioneer and really paving the road and paving the way for women in eye care. It is a pleasure to have you. Welcome to Lou University, Dr. Carlson. Thank you. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here today. So my financial disclosures is I have nothing to disclose. No one wants to hire me. No, I'm joking about that. But um, full disclosure is I really hope to add value to you today. Um, so it's about you and, and making you a better leader and hopefully giving you some ideas and some nuggets. If nothing else, after this presentation, I hope that you've got a, an extensive book list that you want to purchase or the podcasts or the audiobooks that you want to listen to. So uh, let's see what happens here. So today I want to talk about developing the leader within you. This lecture is not about me, but I think it's important to know a little bit about who I am and where I'm coming from, because I think that might make a little difference in my perspectives. Um, obviously, I'm still practicing optometrist. My husband and I started our offices, two locations in rural North Dakota. And yes, Stephanie, we were recruited to North Dakota with the use of a four foot stuffed raccoon to pay for our airline tickets, but that's a different story. Um, so we're still seeing patients. We're still very involved in our profession. Um, we have a partner with us. So we are two thirds female owned and one third male owned, poor Mark. Um, so, and obviously I was the OA president and served as the first female president. That in itself is a different story as well, right? Um, but you know, what happens out of that is I was just so blessed with all of the people that I met along the way that I was given some opportunities. When I got done with being president of the AOA, I thought, well, what now what? What am I gonna do? Like, is this it? Am I, am I done? Like, or what do I go on and what do I do? So because of the connections that I had made, I got asked to do different things and I didn't say no to anything, right? Because I was afraid that if I said no, that I'd never be asked to say, do anything else ever again. And so I was on advisory boards. I was on pharmaceutical advisory boards. I was on um, school board of trustees. I was doing some lectures on glaucoma and doing some lectures for technology. And I, I always did what I said yes to, to the best of my ability, but I started really paying attention to what is it that I really jazzed about? What is it when I was going into doing it, oh, am I excited about doing this? Or is this really like, okay, let's get this done. So what was I really doing my best at? And I started paying attention to the things that gave me the most passion. And, you know, my passion was for my profession because I really got tired of people telling me that I couldn't do something because I was an optometrist. And so that's how my passion started a long time ago. But recently, leadership's been more of what I've been passionate about. And so I went back to school. Um, my kids are really little. Yes, I lied about their ages when I was running for the board of trustees because I was afraid no one would vote for me because I had little boys. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't stretch it too far because obviously I couldn't, but I did. And I got elected and got done. Now I'm home for all the high school stuff and all the basketball games and football games. And I was kind of thinking, what do I want to do next? Right. So. I went back to college when my youngest son went to college. 
And I told my boys, my oldest son, he said, hey, Seth, you know, I'm thinking about that. I'm going to go back and get my master's. And Seth thought, that was really cool, mom. You know, that's really great. You know, after all you've done and you still want to do more that I, you know, he was just kudos to you, mom. My youngest son, just because the different personalities was why on earth would you want to do that? And so it was like, hey, Ian, you know, this is this is something I really feel passionate about. So for a while, three out of the four of us were in college again. I wrote more papers than I ever had written ever in my life, because that's what master's classes are about. Um, I discovered Grammarly.com as like my newest favorite thing. Like, where was that when I was in college the first time? And so, you know, some of the lessons that were learned with that. And one of the very first um, assignments that we had was the question of what is leadership? This is my very first class. And so we had to go through a series of exercises and, and how to do this. We had to do personal mission statements. You know, we, we had a variety of things that we were required to do during this course. But ultimately what happened is my belief that leadership has influenced nothing more, nothing less. And we all have the ability to influence somebody and we do on a regular basis. So by that very definition, each and every one of us is a leader or has the potential to be a leader. We just have to work on all the skills to do that. Think about it. If you're a parent, you influence your kids. If you're a teacher, you influence your students. If you, you know, in a, a friend group, you probably influence your friends. And so there's a variety, of, as doctors, we influence our patients on a daily basis. So there's a variety of ways in which that we influence regularly. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from today is you have the ability to be, to elevate yourself as a leader because you already have the ability to influence. But the thing is, is about leadership is it's intentional. You can't just, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a leader. Yep, yeah, this is what I'm gonna do. Um, and then not do anything about it because it just doesn't work that way. So what you have to do is actually grow on your skills. It starts with the seeds and becomes the major trees that you're planting. And it needs to be really intentional. So let's talk about being intentional today. So first off, it starts with you. There's nobody that's gonna advocate for you. Like Maria said, there's nobody that's gonna advocate for you. So you really have to know you in order to influence somebody else. Um, you know, and, and this is really about understanding your strengths and weaknesses, embracing them. You know, if you have certain weaknesses, the great thing is that you can surround yourself with people who have that skill set. If you understand that I'm not very good at that, but I'm gonna surround myself with somebody who is better at that than I am. Strength finders. Um, I just redid strength finders just a couple of weeks ago, just to see where I was at now. And you know, that's a great way to identify strengths and weaknesses. There's a bunch of other things that you can do. So we'll talk a little bit about personality testing for a minute. Myers-Briggs. Um, I was mentioning to a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago, we got together. She's a school counselor and um, she was asking me what I was up to. And I was telling her that I was preparing for this lecture. And, you know, so I was kind of talking to her about some of this stuff. And she said, oh, yeah, you know, we do all of this stuff in our family. And I said, what? And she said, they're a really big family. There's um, she married into a family that has five siblings. So then it's all the spouses and now it's all the next generation that's happened. So anytime anybody ever gets added to the family, they all do a personality test. They do Myers-Briggs. And they actually share it with everybody in the family and it's really funny because their kids are the ones that actually got them to do this and people are saying I feel so much better understood because my family understands me which I thought was hilarious um I noticed that my friend's daughter got engaged yesterday so I bet Nate will be doing a Myers-Briggs here pretty soon again so the other one too is personality plus that's one um, a friend of mine who's an optometrist is a practice management guru and she really embraces this particular one, easy test, easy to do. You know, it's just a little personality test, but she uses it in her office. And so everybody in her office has this, um, kind of knows where they're at so that they can understand and incorporate each other, each other's personalities and to understand each other. That's kind of redundant, but. The other one is Gretchen Rubin's got the four tendencies. There's a bunch of color-based ones um, that are just kind of fun to do. But any of these, and a bunch of them are free. So any of these will kind of give you an idea of, of where you might be at with your personality, because it's about understanding you first. 
Myers-Briggs, I think there's 16 different um, variations of what can happen. This gentleman distilled Myers-Briggs down so that it's actually just into five. And so it's the five voices. And it talks about, um, in this particular one, talks about that if you have a team, if you have somebody representing all of the different voices on your team, then sometimes that's a team that works better together because it can be more strategic and it kind of covers all the bases so that you're not all the same personality. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when we hire people or work with people or gravitate towards people, we tend to gravitate towards people who have the same personality as us? I've caught myself doing that. But when you're aware of it, then you kind of realize that a little bit more. Sally Hogshead, I have never had the opportunity to listen to her, but I guess Essler has used her a few times for speaking events and talking about personality. One of my friends who actually saw her in person said that she told the story that with the last name Hogshead, she had to come up with something really interesting to inspire people and, and make people think about something other than her last name. So she's got another one um, that you can easily do the assessment and find out um, where you're at, what your personality type is with that. Realize that if you do some of these, um, Gretchen Rubin is constantly sending me emails now, so Sally Hogg said, but I enjoy them because I like looking at them and, and kind of learning more things, but just be aware that if you have an email address, you might be solicited for some other things. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about DISC today. And what I'm gonna say about DISC is, I first got introduced to DISC when I was on the AOA board and all of us went to Alcon campus and Alcon was kind of leading us through an exercise and um, we were doing DISC profiles as part of that exercise. And um, it turns out at that time, and I don't know if they still do, um, and J&J &J as well. So Alcon and J&J &J is two major industry partners that I know of with our profession. We're really instrumental in using DISC. And we were listening to this presentation about this and we all had our profiles in front of us. And I jokingly said, well, what do you do? Like post these DISC profiles of everybody outside of their office cubicles so managers know how to handle and, and communicate with their, their uh, people? And the answer was yes. Oh, what a concept. So uh, actually because of Elcon and J&J, &J, a lot of information has been done with using DISC and kind of how it fits into our office settings. And to be honest, we started using DISC, um, well, probably a few years ago now, when we were trying to hire somebody. It's not the um, decision-making item, but it is a tool that we use, because if you ever interviewed anybody and you get this 20 minute interview, 30 minute interview, and then you hire them, they come to work and you're thinking, oh my gosh, like, who are you? And what have you done with the person that I interviewed? So they're just totally different. And I really enjoyed using DISC as a tool when we've been looking at it because you know a little bit more about people's personalities before they're actually hired. Um, and again, we don't use that as the decision-making, but it's part of the tool. So let's talk a little bit about this. You know, the DISC is dominant, uh, the influencer, the compliant, and the steady. And more, some are more introverted, extroverted, some are more task-oriented, some are more people-oriented. So if we were in together, I would do this as an audience participation thing. And so let's talk about the driver and the dominant style right now. So those people need to be in charge. They need to be real go-getters. They focus on that no-nonsense no approach to results. And if you want to talk to them, don't waste their time because they're very time sensitive. Be really organized and to the point um, and get to the bottom line. That's kind of these people. And so you probably can think of people in your life that are very dominant or a driver type of personality. Um, and it doesn't take very long to figure that out. Um, but if, if I was going to ask you in our offices, who, if you look at all the places that people work in our office, where may, might a high D personality fit really well? And that would be an office manager. Um, I was leading a, a, a smaller group, probably 50 people in the room one day, and we were having this discussion. And I love the story because this woman raised her hand and she said, we did this in our office and we found out what all of us were doing. And, and so our office manager, some of us just couldn't stand because some days she was just a bear and you couldn't understand why, where she was coming from. And so they did a disc um, 
disk analysis kind of thing as a retreat with our office. And she said it just changed everybody completely in the office because now they realized that that office manager was having a really high D day. So they would joke about it and say, oh, be careful. She's on a real high D today. So if you want to go talk to her, just be really careful about that. And it became this joke. But the owners of the practice actually said that it really kind of changed the dynamic with the staff because they could understand each other better. So then there's the influencers. Those are the friendly, enthusiastic people. Those will know all about your kids, know what you like to do after work. Um, they, they thrive on feedback, okay? Um, they're very charismatic and optimistic people. And so if you're an employer or work with somebody who is an influencer, you know, they want recognition. They want people to support their ideas and opinions and be nodding their heads and like, yeah, yeah, that's good. I like that idea. And they want that feedback. And they thrive on that. So if you look at somebody who might be a good or position, job position in our offices, an optician who's in high eye does a really good job. Um, they'll know all about if they golf or if they're on the computer or they start asking questions. And pretty soon, just in the course of conversation, they become your next best friend. And um, my son is always collecting new best friends. He'll do fine when he graduates from college. But you know, it's one of those individuals that just has that charismatic ability. And opticians in that situation work really well. Now, I have a staff person, she's kind of transitioned over a little bit, but she's been with us for 30 years. She is not a high I, um, she's a high C, which we'll get to in a second. But if um, she's been an optician for years and years and years, and now we've kind of moved her into a different position because she was getting tired of doing what she was doing after 30 years. So if the lab bill goes up 25 cents, I knew about it. Um, one of the frame companies started charging us sales tax for our frames, which they shouldn't have been doing. Of course she caught it. So, you know, that's one of those detailed and you know, oriented people, but she did a really good job in the optical as well. There's the study style. These are the warm, nurturing, people oriented. They're relaxed, kind of loyal, they're risk averse, um, you know, they have sincere interest. It's about feelings. You know, those folks also want approval. Don't really back them into a corner because they don't really do well with that, with confrontation. And so the people in our office that fit well for this, techs, um, they do really well with a study style. Or, or tech who is a study style does really well because they do really well with patients. And what um, our ophthalmic industry partners have found is that most optometrists tend to be high S's as well. So I guess that's our personality traits in general, on average. Of course, there's always exceptions to the rules. And then there's the clients that I kind of already alluded to. These are the folks that are um, give them the rules and they're going to follow the rules. They are the problem solvers. They are the detail-oriented people. Um, they want data. They want details. They're systematic, you know, just very you know, methodical about how they handle things. My optician is a very high C person. She follow the rules. Um, but these in our offices, people who bill insurance, these are great people because they will follow the rules and they'll just be really methodical and they'll they'll work at that because they're they're more task oriented. You know, so give them a problem with the insurance and not paying, these guys will be on it. So I just thought that was kind of interesting that um J and J and L kind of learned a little bit about our offices and our personalities and how it kind of fits into our offices. And I challenge you to take a little bit of time and do this disprofile.com actually is they would just raise their prices. It used to be $72. I think it's a little higher now. And that's what we use for our staff, but there's all kinds of free ones online. So if you want to just do one yourself and find out where you fall into that, you'll find it online. So while we can't change our personalities, we can change how we react to people. And so emotional intelligence has become kind of a real big buzzword, two words, I guess it is. Great book. I encourage you to read the book. Um, what happens is if you purchase the book, there's a scratch off code inside of it that you can take the assessment beforehand and then you can go back, read the book and then take the assessment after the fact. And so it'll kind of talk to you about how that you've changed or how you've raised your level of emotional awareness. So think of these people as being really self-aware, calmer emotions, lots of empathy, 
motivated, have great social skills. Think Oprah Winfrey. She's got a really high EQ. Um, and, you know, so somebody who's really empath empathetic in that respect and, and just does really well with people. We can change these skills. Um, I was in a small group again, and I was visiting with somebody who shared that um, she can cry really easily when she's confronted by her staff or, or, you know, put in situations that she has really troubles like controlling her emotions. And that's something that all of us can really work on because that can happen. You get so caught up in the emotion that you are just like having troubles, like containing it and, and kind of re controlling it and, and reeling it in. So our emotional intelligence can be actually increased just by self-awareness. So I really encourage you to work on this one too, another book that you might want. So how do you develop your leader skill, leadership skills? Well, first thing is you can Google it, you know, that Google's a verb now. So you can go on and Google anything like, how do I develop myself as a leader and just see what Google pops up with it? It's kind of interesting. But I'll tell you a few things that I have found. Podcasts. Uh, I don't have a commute time. I'm fortunate enough to live one mile from my office. And so I don't really listen to a bunch of podcasts. But sometimes when I've been out walking or doing things that I'm kind of tired of listening to music, I'll turn on a podcast. I know a bunch of people that do it with, when they're commuting. I have a friend who um, tries to walk five miles a day and she's listening to audible books all the time and she's listening to podcasts. And so as I, I, I put it out there, like what do people listen to? And these are some of the ones that kind of came back. Um, John Maxwell has a great podcast and I'm a certified speaker with John Maxwell. So I'm a huge John Maxwell fan. So that might show up a little bit here or later too, but anything with him, he's got a, a great reputation as far as leadership. Mind Your Own Business has been a really great podcast, I'm told. I'm only listening to a couple of them. Same thing with Truly Human Leadership. I listened to one of these just recently. And it was interesting because the, the person who was talking talked about the traits of truly human leadership being the three H's, being honest, humble, and human. Honest, of course, meaning honesty, being humble, and human being, like really relate to humans. Human or People who are good leaders tend to relate to humans very well. And so that's a trait that we need. After all, we're about influence, right? Uh, TED Talks. I love TED Talks. They're short. They're 10 minutes, 15 minutes. They've got great presentations. They've got great ideas. And you can find a TED Talk in just about anything. Um, here's a, just a couple of, of ones that I've listened to that I thought were really good. I love Simon Sinek's um, TED Talks. Um, when I was looking, there was a, a piece that I found about the 10, the five most inspiring TED Talks that help you be a better leader. And there's all kinds of things out there. Um, the nice thing about those that I've found is that people who are out in the real world are sharing lessons that they've learned with their businesses, with their research. Um, there's been some great ones that I've listened to about teachers um, and, you know, just lots of different things that are out there for the topics. And so many things are just really relevant to any part of our lives. So I encourage you to just check out TED Talks if you haven't already. Um, I actually sent TEDx Fargo, North Dakota an email wondering how I could sign up to do a TED Talk. So we'll see. Um, I don't know if I'll hear from them, but we'll see if I get out there. Books. Oh. I have a stack of books underneath my desk here. Uh, and I had a really hard time like picking which books that I would show up on this slide because there are so many. In fact, I kept changing them because I was finishing my presentation. It was like, oh no, this book's better. Oh wait, I need to show this book. So I can't tell you enough about how good some of these books are and how inspiring they are. Um, John Maxwell, of course, like I said, I'm a big fan of John Maxwell. I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek's um, Lead most people know we'll start with why, but Leaders Eat Last is a good reference as well. There's so many out there that are, are short, um, some are longer, some are really super easy reads, some require a little bit of effort. Um, I've actually led masterminds through the Invaluables, 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth. And what we did was I assigned people chapters. And so I would assign two chapters a week. People would read the chapters and we'd get on a Zoom chat or a video or a phone call conference call. And I would start asking people about what they thought about the chapters. And there's no way to 
really digest it because I've read this book so many times. There's some, no real way to digest it until you just take it a chapter or two at a time and just really think about the concepts and then implement it. That's a big thing. You know, so many of us like read this book and we get all fired up about it, right? And then we do nothing because we're humans. I mean, that's just what happens. So, I, you know, I encourage you that if you do start to read some of these, don't read it like all in one night. You know, take a piece of it, maybe read a chapter or two at a time so that you can actually stop and think about it. And what does that really mean to you as a leader? And how does it help you develop your leadership skills? So the other thing that you can do is there's some cool things out there. You could go get a master's in leadership. Um, not that everybody has to do that, but that would be an option. Uh, I noticed our extension agency, our county extension agency is doing a leadership thing right now where every Wednesday they've um, got high school students as well as business owners and people of the community and they're just meeting around the county in different locations every Wednesday afternoon and they're going through a leadership course. What a great way. Uh, a little town next door to me was looking for people to serve in their chamber of commerce and try to be leaders in their community. And they actually developed a lead program that people of the community went through. And so teaching them how to do better, to be better leaders. Things in your community that might be available that you don't even really know about that actually be fun and a great networking experience because you end up being with like-minded people. Uh, ironically, when I did my master's program, uh, there was a, a patient of mine who also in, in, uh, enrolled in the same program at the same time. And she lives in a different town in a different community, but we've kept in touch. And it's been fun because when we've gotten together, it's like that positive energy just kind of feeds positive energy. So when you're around that positivity, it's easy to kind of keep it going and keep it um, motivational. We, we joke that we get together for big sky coffee. So it's our big sky talk. So what could we do if, if we, if there was no limits and no barriers, what could we do with our communities? And, and that's kind of some of our conversations. I, I'll just put a shout out for Right Now Media. It's a subscription thing that you have to sign up. But Right Now Media is a faith-based, um, I was gonna use the word product. I don't really quite know. Digital medium, I guess it is, but it's, it's Right Now Media. You can sign up so that you join the membership and there's a, a bunch of leadership things inside of there for parents and how you lead your kids, you know, how you are with your community, how you are with work, developing your leadership skills as a, as a boss. Um, you know, so there's some great um, information in there. I know I've listened to Chick-fil-A's CEO a few times on there. John Maxwell's on there with videos and they're all video content. So they're kind of easy to just listen to. So that might be another option. And never underestimate the value of mentorship. And I know um, Maria was talking about sponsorship and that's a really great point as far as finding somebody who can be a sponsor and kind of help elevate you, but never underestimate having coffee with a mentor or calling them up on a Zoom chat if you're not local or whatever it might be, or getting together at a meeting. Um, I purposefully have gone to academy meetings and I've set up lunches or coffee dates or, um, and if you're listening, you know who you are, because I will seek you out and go, all right, you have to have coffee and you have to tell me what's going on in your part of the world so that we can be better leaders together. And it, I've purposely done that. And so and with COVID, I've really missed doing that. So I'm looking forward to getting back to some meetings and, and starting up those little coffee chats that I've done. I would highly encourage you to do that. Find somebody you admire, somebody who you think has some skill set that you'd be interested in and just bounce ideas off. And remember, there's a difference between being a boss and being a leader. There's a huge difference. And so what you want to do is you want to be that leader that's part of the team because a leader is a part of the team. They're not just giving out directions. And it's really incumbent upon you as the leader to what's your why? You know, okay, if we're about influence and leadership is influence and the ability to influence people, I think it really comes with authentic leadership as a person. And if people know your why and why you do things, what you're passionate about, where you come from, and, you know, in your office, like if you're going to change, we'll pick EHRs because that's really super traumatic for everybody. You know, it's about stating your why and why are we doing this and, and what's happening. Years ago, we changed EHRs. And... Um, there was going to be mutiny in our office because people were just that upset and about the fact that we changed and what was happening. So I said to my husband, 
we have to do something. So what we did is we invited all of our staff to our house and we ordered in live lobsters and we cooked for them. And we picked lobsters because lobsters are messy. There's no way you can have a formal dinner at all when you're pulling apart the claw off of a lobster and opening it up and having that gray stuff shoot all over you, right? So bibs and the whole bit. And so what happened was we started out the dinner, we cooked for them, we had all this set up, and we, but before we sat down to eat, we just said, okay, tonight, I want you to complain as much as you want about our EHR, you know, get it out of your system. Tell us everything that you hate, because on Monday, we're still going to be on the same EHR. And this is why we switched EHRs. And remember, this was the reason why we did this in the first place, because if we go back, you know, then we have those same problems again. And so, you know, were we great leaders? I don't know. We just kind of had an idea, like, let's get lobster and cook. And in the end, it was like hindsight makes you smart, right? <clears throat> in the end, it was probably one of the smartest things that we ever did. But communicate your why, because that's your job as a leader. I was specifically asked, <clears throat> sorry, I was specifically asked to cover what happens when you don't want to, when you don't feel like being a leader, when you're drained, when you, um, leadership is hard, you know, and part of it is you're always on, you know, because you're the leader, so you're supposed to always be on, and sometimes that's really hard to do and really drawn out basis. You know, I used to come home from meetings when I was on the AOA board, you know, having been around people all weekend long and just really realizing that even though I'm an extrovert, I needed to go find my space in nature and just go for a walk and listen to the birds and just kind of be by myself for a little while so I could decompress and just kind of not be around people for a while. So, you know, this is kind of the conversation is, well, what do you do when leadership becomes kind of hard? How do you recharge? It's not selfish to have self-care moments, right? For me, you know, sometimes I'll listen to the news and I get really caught up with the news. Don't be afraid to turn off the news. Turn on music. Do something that gets you away from whatever's creating that anxiety. You know, I know some of my friends are really watching what's going on in the Ukraine and that's all they can talk about. And you can just tell their level of anxiety is already kind of getting up. And it's like, I actually told one of my friends, you know, maybe you should turn off the news for a day and just like not follow it. Um, control the things you can control. You know, sometimes it, sometimes things are out of your control, but pick what you can control and, and work on that. Learn to say no, okay, selectively. Um, but, you know, say no when it's not a good time for you. Um, you know, meditate, massage. Um, Books, podcasts, things that get you motivated again, things that get you jazzed up. Spend some time with family and friends. Visit with friends that maybe you haven't talked to for a while that are always like the positive people, which reminds me, go hang out with the positive people and just kind of minimize your time with those negative people. And you know who I'm talking about, because there's people that will suck all of the positive energy that you have just right out of the life of you. So if you can avoid some of those folks, then that will help. Um, my youngest son wants to be an FBI agent. And, you know, it's a process, right? But all I could tell him for advice, and hopefully it's good advice, we'll see what happens. But I just said, well, you're going to deal with humanity at its worst on an every single day basis. So just make sure you surround yourself with really positive people to re-energize yourself when you're done dealing with humanity. Kudos to him if he wants to do that. Um, we'll see what happens. But, you know, we're on positive people. Gratitude journals. I have a friend who told me the five minute, um, the five minute journal is what she uses every single day. And it's a gratitude journal. It's something that she writes in every single day and in the morning while she's having her coffee. It's like coffee self-talk. Um, you know, and here's another thing that happens because I, I, young women in particular have come up to me over the years. And have sometimes been in tears about how I'll never forget this one young woman that I had a visit with and she was just overwhelmed in her life and she was an optometrist and she was, you know, it, worried about her career and doing things with that. And then she brings up her kids and she's talking about what needs to be done with her kids. And she actually mentioned um, her husband babysitting. Okay. And so I kind of stopped her right there. And if there's a life lesson that I can share with you that I've learned 
is if you are fortunate enough, if you are a parent and you are fortunate enough to have a significant other as a co-parent that's with you, and you're not a single mom and have all of those issues, like, kudos to you guys, because I don't know how you do it. But if you do have a significant other that's part of your parental abilities, let them be a parent. They don't babysit. You know, they, they are parents as well. Will they do it exactly like you? Probably not. Um, will the dishes be dirty or will the clothes be clean or something when you come home? Maybe not. But you know what? They'll probably do just fine. And it's a good lesson for them too, as well, to be a parent. So just back off a little bit and let your cohort be a parent as well. Um, I was giving a similar talk. My oldest son's 25 now. Probably about five years ago, I went to him and I said, okay, Seth, I'm, asked, I'm doing a talk. I've been asked to talk about this topic. I just got to know. Anything that you just really were upset about the fact that I missed when you were growing up? And um, my son has kind of a sarcastic sense of humor. And he looks at me and he goes, like what? And I said, no, seriously. If there, you know, were you ever upset about something that I might have missed because I was traveling to the AOA board and, you know, I was all busy with doing other things? And he's like, um, kind of looks at me like I'm going crazy. Uh, no. And I was like, really? And he's like, no, because I was really proud of you. I thought it was great. Maybe I didn't quite understand it when I was little, but I sure was proud of you when I got older. And my other son kind of said something similar. So you are, uh, you are a leader by example in those situations. And, you know, I joke that I was trying to raise good husbands. So that's just a piece of advice that I kind of feel strongly about, obviously. Oh, and one last thing, you can always go watch Hallmark movies. Remember, it's always going to be the guy in the vest or the guy with the plaid shirt that's going to get the girl. So, and practice more I am statements and specifically more I am positive statements, not I am fat or I am, you know, whatever. It's about I am strong. I am, you know, powerful. I am, you know, because there's lots of studies been done with the words that we say to ourselves. And if you think about what we say to our friends, if our friend was down, speak to yourself like you're a friend of yourself, because we can all be really, really hard on ourselves. But I encourage you to be positive to yourself and be kind to yourself. It makes a real difference in how you end up spending your day. And my last little book that I've just been all over about was one of my more recent reads. Um, Jeff Henderson is, he worked in marketing for Chick-fil-A for many years and, and tells some pretty hilarious stories. I first discovered him with a motivational talk that he did um, on stage and then kind of went up further and found this book. And the concepts of this book are know what you're for, okay? So he starts out in the book of being for your business and talks about, you know, being for your community and what your, your business can do for your community and, and how you look at it. There's a section in the book that's about for your team because word of mouth is the single best word of advertising, form of advertising. Um, you can push out all kinds of things on social media, but what people respond to the most is when social media, your patients say something about you. Um, for example, we share pictures of our little kids when they come in for their infancy exams with, you know, I had my first eye exam at Heartland Eye Care. Those are the pieces that get shared on social media all the time. Our canned stuff about new frames or whatever, maybe we get one like, that's it. So it's about being for your community and doing what you can for your community to make your community better. The last part of the book is about being for you and just never underestimating the fact of what you need to be doing for yourself to grow yourself. I'm gonna share a couple of concepts and I'm gonna try not to read so much, but here, so I don't forget them. You know, one way is move at a sustainable pace and rest when you need to. Um, think for 30 minutes a day. And while you're having your coffee, I'm reading a book called Coffee Self-Talk right now. And because coffee, having your coffee in the morning or whatever your ritual may already be a habit, if you stack another positive habit with it, then it just makes it, be an even bigger positive thing. So think for 30 minutes a day, maybe while you're having your coffee. A great day starts the night before. Find a mentor, which we already kind of talked about. 
ask for something big, something that you think that might not even never happen, but you never be afraid to ask, you know? So if you think of something like me asking, how do you sign up for a TED talk? How do you, to do a TED talk, you know, ask for something big because you never know what might the answer be and be humble. You know, that's the concepts that he shares in the book. The thing that's really cool about this book, yeah, it's a great book. It's an easy read. I encourage you to kind of give it a look. Um, At the very end of the book, he shares his cell phone number. And he talks about the fact that he would love to hear from you because he believes in you. And um, he would love to hear from you about the concepts that you learned from the book and how you think that he might have impacted your life. So I'm driving home from a board meeting. And it's nine o'clock on a Friday night. And I finished this book. I had it on Audible. And so I'm listening to it in my car after a four-hour drive. And um, I thought, really? Would he really do that? Okay, fine. So I pulled into my driveway. I sent a text. Hey, Jeff, this is so-and-so. I just finished your book. Know what you're for. And these are the concepts I got out of it. I'm a small business owner. And I speak to people about leadership. I truly intend to use some of your content concepts in my talks. Not 15 minutes later, I got a text message back from him saying how awesome it was that he heard from me and that he loves small business owners. He hoped that I could share those concepts and that he was for Dory. How cool is that? So, and of course, I told him I would share that story. So concepts to think about. And, you know, I'm a huge fan. (laughs) Somebody says, hey, Share the last picture you took uh, on your phone. Oh my gosh, I have so many saved motivational things on my phone that I think that's what the bulk of all my pictures are. So remember, you can do this. It's about elevating yourself and about investing in yourself and just kind of putting some time into doing things for yourself. So a little bit of a goal exercise, okay? And I'm not there. If I was there with you, I'd be walking around amongst the group and I'd be watching you. But I would really want you to take out a piece of paper, pen, whatever you've got, a post-it note that might be sitting next to you, whatever it might be, okay? And I want you to write down what can you do in the next 30 days to develop your leadership skills, okay? What happens is when we listen to motivational things, and hopefully there's been something motivational about this for you or inspiring, what we do is it releases dopamine in the brain. And we get this dopamine hit that's like, yeah, this is great. And it's this positive thing. And you just want more dopamine and you want to feed off of that, right? And you keep going with it. But then what happens is life gets in the way. And when the next talk happens or when your child walks in the room or when you, you know, get caught doing something else, you lose that dopamine rush. And now you stop thinking about it. And so before you lose it, I want you to write it down, okay? So SMART, if you don't know, haven't heard this before, but here's the SMART system for goal writing. Be really specific. So I want you to name one thing that you're going to do, okay? Is it measurable? So how will you measure the success? Look back on it. Um, you know, make a note in your calendar or something that you actually uh, did it. If you're doing the coffee self-talk, right? Um, make a note in your calendar that you did it every single day. That's how you measure it. Is it achievable? Is it something that you can actually do in 30 days? You may not finish a master's course in 30 days. That might take a couple of years. So think about something that's achievable to do in the next 30 days. Is it relevant? So relevant specifically to your leadership skills and in growing yourself as a leader. And then time bound. We already said 30 days. So hopefully you've written something down. What would be even better is if you took out your phone and you sent a text to one of your colleagues, your friends, another female optometrist, text it to me if you've got my number. You know, tell me what you're gonna do. And um, actually I'll tell you, 701-331-1500. Text me with what you can do in the next 30 days. And so here's my final thought. Um, You know, I just told you earlier, learn how to say no, right? And when I was listening to Maria, you know, there was a great information, right? But here's what I've also found too, is that I've gone up to people, women in particular, when I've tried to kind of be their mentor and kind of encourage them to go along and told them, you know, I really need somebody to help me out with this. I need somebody 
who's you, who's, you know, encouraging them to do something, to serve on a board, whatever it might be. And they tell me, no, okay, that's fine. If you tell me no, because you're really super busy or, you know, it's really not a good time, your mom died or, you know, obviously there's stuff in life, right? But if you tell me no, because you're scared, that's a different reason. And so what I really want you to do is go outside of your comfort zone and do something that you're scared of doing. Public speaking is one of the biggest things that people are scared about. Um, dying while you're public speaking is even worse. But, um, you know, do something that scares you because I can guarantee you that once you do that, your level of confidence in yourself will be much greater. You'll realize that you can actually do things that you never thought that you could do before. And there's just this, yeah that you get by doing something that scares you. So my final thought, for a second to final thought, is, um, all right, if you have a rubber band, grab it. A hair band kind of works too, but think of what a rubber band does, okay? So this is the law of the rubber band from the 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth. Rubber bands are meant to be useful. So you take them and you put them around a shoebox and you've got stuff in there and the, it holds the lid on the shoebox. Maybe you've got a group of pens or pencils and you, you, know, you don't want them floating all over your drawer. So you use a rubber band to bind them all together. I mean, there's all these uses for rubber bands and that's the only thing that they're, they're supposed to do is they're supposed to be used. They're supposed to be stretched, okay? So if you take a brand new rubber band that's never been used before and you use it for what it's meant to be and you stretch it, it will never go back to the same size it was before because it's grown. And so if you think about that analogy, how we are as people, we are as leaders, we are as humans, you know, it kind of goes along with do something that scares you, take the rubber band and stretch it because you'll be amazed at how much it grows and how much you get in the end just because of the fact that you stretch the rubber band. So I encourage you to say yes to the things that scare you because you will learn so many things about yourself and about what you can accomplish. Um, and I guarantee you that you'll be so proud of yourself once you do it. And so my final thought for today, because I am a past AOA president, um, I went around to all the schools and colleges of optometry when I was president and president-elect. I think there's only a couple that I haven't been to. Um, I actually went to U-Pike after, after I was done with the AOA board. So I've been to a few afterwards even. So there's just a couple of the newest ones that I haven't been. Um, but I got the opportunity to speak to the students at all of those schools. And message that I said was, you know, we as leaders, and, and this is the great thing about us, is we have an opportunity inside of our profession to use our leadership skills because there are opportunities. And as Maria pointed out, there's so many things that are still untapped that we can do. So I want you to leave optometry better than the way you found it. Um, no one else is gonna advocate for our profession. Ophthalmology is not gonna adv advocate for it. Legislatures don't care about our profession. You know, it's something that we do every single day about how we take care of our patients and what we do and the better care that we take for our patients, the better our profession is. And so I just encourage you, use your newly found leadership skills or newly honed as your growth is and say yes to something that you might be asked to do for our profession and lead our profession better than the way you found it. Amazing, Dory. That was that was great. I mean, just I love all the comments and just kind of your experiences, sharing stories about your son and just kind of the the things that make you excited and passionate. And and uh, that's actually something I'm learning is um, myself is I'm doing a course called Time Genius, where it's teaching me to identify the things that are priorities in life and um, letting go of some of the other things that aren't. And uh, I was it you that told the story about how you used to write cards? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I remember that. I remember you telling a story about, you know, if you're finding yourself in a position where you're doing like 8 million things, you're stressed out all the time and you feel overwhelmed and you feel like you're not giving your all in all the different things because you're being pulled in so many directions that it's okay to let something go that, uh, you know, you maybe thought. Well, that you, know, kind of, 
the 80 mm-hmm. 20 rule is a real thing. I mean, that is a real Italian, an Italian philosopher, uh, Cridal. I think that was how you pronounce his name. Um, anyway, it's his principle, and it, it's it's been documented over and over and over again that sometimes we spend 80 you know, we spend 20% of our time doing 80% of the things that aren't going to do any good, right? So if you stop and think about what's your return on investment, if you yeah. really do, what's your priorities? If you spend 80% of your time doing the 20 things, you know, if you've got 20 things to do, do the top two and that's it. And delegate as much as you can. Um, you know, you're just going to find work-life balance is better when you do that too. Yeah. And I love that advice because um, it's just... I think a lot of us just think that we have to do it all and we have to do this and we can't get help and, um, you know, or there's excuses on why they, why you can't get help and, and all these things. So I, I just really excited that you were able to present something of, of that. And we, we do have some questions. Okay. Um, someone wants to know if you had to pick two or three books to mm. gift a young woman starting out in optometry, what would you recommend? Oh my goodness, because there's so many. Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> um, oh, this one. The 11 Commandments of Wildly Successful Women. That's one. Mm. I haven't read that one in a long time, but I remember liking it when I read it. Um, there's one that I, and I haven't read this book yet, but um, I listened to him in a talk. It's called Love Works, and it's the Timeless Principles for Effective Leaders. And it's basically about, you know, loving your people that you work with or your team and about just spreading that positive energy. And right now I'm truly in love with four. Um, know what you're for. So, and there's so many. I mean, I, I, this, all these books behind me, much more are leadership books. So it's just something I've been real passionate about. So that off the top of my head, you know, as soon as we get done here, I'll probably think of five more. But Yeah, and she's... Dr. Carlson has graciously offered her email address. So whoever asked that question, you can always email her and she'll, I'm sure she'll come up with a great list of books for us. Um, another person wants to know, what are some of the challenges related to your gender that you encountered on your path toward your leadership roles? Oh. Well, a couple of thoughts is I didn't necessarily always feel that I was ever discriminated against. Um, but in hindsight, when I look at things, I, I, I realize situations now, you know, age gives us a different perspective. And I realize now that maybe there was times, well, I can think of a lot of times that, you know, maybe there was some things going on that I wasn't necessarily the person that was asked to do certain things because of gender. Um, and no offense to my male colleagues, okay, if you are listening to this, but, um, no offense to you guys, okay? But and again, I think that sometimes they don't really realize they're doing it. I really do believe that because, you know, over the years, I've kind of pointed it out to some people. And now I have some of my male colleagues that are really amazing advocates for me when they really recognize that I, we were working with a motivational speaker who was really chauvinistic. I just, I could not believe how chauvinistic he was. And he wouldn't talk to me, but he would talk to my male colleague. And Finally, my male colleague called him on the carpet and said, you do realize that you're never answering Dory's questions and you're never talking to her. And ironically, the guy had two daughters. So I really would have expected different behavior from him, but it's kind of interesting. And then here's the other thing is women can be really hard on other women. Oh, some of the worst conversations I had were women who accused me of some really awful things or, you know, that. I wasn't thick skinned enough or, you know, just different things like that. And I just, it's made me much more cognizant of what I say to other women. So, you know, I, I just hope that we all work to elevate each other with positive things because the more we elevate each other, the better our world can be. Yeah. And, and I like how you say that, you know, elevating each other is important and it's not about bashing one person or the other. I mean, there's always going to be in any industry, like just a particular person that, um, you know, maybe causing issues. It's not necessarily men, women, this and that, but I, I totally agree with you as far as getting, I guess, 
getting the conversations going and having more discussions. I, I think that Maria did a great job expressing that that's one of the ways that we can kind of help some of these things is, is having more open lines of communication. And I think you're right, Dory, you know, some of the men are, are some of our biggest advocates and cheerleaders. And I mean, they, a lot of them in the industry have been incredible as far as helping women to push the industry forward. So um, I, I agree that it's, it's all about positivity and really just elevating each other, you know, as, and the profession as a whole, I think is, is really a key, a key point. Agree. Um, last question here. Dr. Lamb wants to know, do you have any advice for young women professionals who are trying to break barriers in male dominated workspaces? Well, you know, I think it's about that's such a multifaceted question. <laughs> um, so, okay, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on the young professional, okay? Because you used the word young, correct? Yes. So here's the thing, is you come out of school and maybe, maybe we have this preconceived notion of what should be happening. And I know that I kind of did this as, well, I know I did this, that I thought people should just give me credit because I'm a woman and I know this and, you know, I'm a doctor or whatever. Um, I got really upset with bankers that wouldn't talk to me, um, you know, and, and trying to get bank loans and, and different things. And I just, I, I kind of lost it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but there again, hopefully you become wiser as you get older and it's about emotional intelligence and it's really about how you react because the only thing you can control is your reaction. So if you really work on, and I'm going to throw out emotional intelligence, um, the better your emotional intelligence is, the more that you are self-aware of how you carry yourself and the confidence that you have, you know, eventually those barriers are going to break down. I mean, they just, they will naturally over time, but sometimes we automatically expect it to be there right away. And, you know, with anything, and it's guys too. I mean, I've talked to enough young male students, new grads that, you know, they kind of have the same issues, but perception wise, you know, sometimes women are perceived that, oh, you're going to just have kids or, you know, we're not going to ask you to do that because of that whole issue. But I think you just have to be real persistent and, and know to be able to self-aware and, and control your emotions when you're doing some of that stuff. Um, and it's weird because I became an empty nester and I had somebody calling me up to see if I would do something for public policy. And, you know, it was potentially going to be time in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I said yes. But as I was saying, yes, the male that asked me to do this said, oh, but you have kids and you may have to and not have time. And, you know, if you like, you know, it's like giving me all these excuses why I probably couldn't, even though he was asking me to do this. And I just laughed and I said, do you have any idea how much time being on the AOA board takes? And I had little kids. So I think that's really ironic that you're saying that to me now when I'm almost an empty nester. I think we're pretty good at this point. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll, I'll go back one last thing because I'm going to harp on this a little bit because it happens over and over and over again when people talk to me. Um, when I first got on the AOE board, I had two little boys. I had all the gift gifts wrapped for the birthday party that was three days from now. I had all the clothes washed. I had outfits laid out. I had, I mean, I had food prepared so there was leftovers in the refrigerator. I mean, I did it all because I was like super guilty about the fact that I was traveling for AOA and I had little people at home. My husband's an avid cyclist and don't get me wrong. He is a wonderful, wonderful parent. Okay. Um, great, great guy. Um, but he went on a cycling trip for a week and there was no food in the fridge. There was no clothes that were washed. There was no presents that were wrapped for the birthday parties. There was no, and I'm picking on things, right. The, just that I can kind of think of off the top of my head. And I thought, you know, no, no, this is where that stops. And so mm -hmm. I stopped being an enabler and I just kind of learned something about myself because it was my own fault. Um, so, you know, just take a look in the mirror and, and just be careful that you're not doing that to yourself. That's great advice. I think that um, taking responsibility for what is happening in your life is also really important. So like you said, if you were the one that was basically doing the dishes and making meals and having, making sure their clothes were done, you know, all these things. And then, you know, your husband wasn't doing those things. I mean, I guess that's a really 
you know, kind of a moment to take a step back and say, hey, what can I do to change this? What conversations need to be had in the household and how are we going to figure this out together? I right. think um, I, I love that. I love taking responsibility for for what's happening in your life. I am such a huge, huge believer in that. So I love that you said that because I think a lot of people listening in, whether male or female, um, can relate to that as far as, oh, yeah, you know, I feel like maybe that maybe I am doing that. Maybe you can relate to this. And, and instead of getting upset or um, frustrated, right. you know, maybe just taking a step back and saying, you know, well, well, just how really changes. sometimes it's us that enable it, you know, so it's yeah. not that anybody's bad or anybody right. has in behavior that's not appropriate. It's just that sometimes we just enable the behavior. And so just, yeah. yeah, take a step back. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Dr. Carlson. This was a wonderful lecture.